public transit aids community progress. Public transit brings more customers to the stores, makes it easier for workers to get to and from work, and helps relieve traffic congestion. Central Standard Time at the Tone, 9 o'clock. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Tonight, from Hollywood, the makers of Hallmark greeting cards bring you Deborah Carr in Margaret Landon's Anna and the King of Siam on the Hallmark Playhouse. Each week, Hallmark will bring you Hollywood's greatest stars in outstanding stories chosen by one of the world's best-known authors, the distinguished novelist, Mr. James Hilton. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is James Hilton. To view a story that for charm and delicacy must rank high among the tales of recent years. It's by Margaret Landon. And if I were asked what it's about, I could only tell you it's about, well, Anna and the King of Siam. In fact, it's one of the few titles nowadays that really do mean what they say. In her book, Miss Landon has been able to combine her own personal knowledge of the country with the rather wonderful career of the real-life Anna, who actually lived in Siam almost 90 years ago. I think you'll enjoy this story, which so artfully combines the wisdom of the Orient with the practicality of a very delightful schoolmarm. And for the school more delightful than Deborah Carr, that lovely actress who has endeared herself to millions on both sides of the Atlantic. And now about Hallmark. Thank you, Mr. Hilton. Hallmark cards have a magic carpet quality about them. They take you visiting, however great the distance, to help celebrate a birthday, an anniversary, or just any day when you're thinking of someone. There is a quality about Hallmark cards that whispers good taste. And identifying Hallmark on the back adds meaning. It says you cared enough to send the very best. Now, Hallmark Playhouse, presenting Margaret Landon's Anna and the King of Siam, starring Deborah Carr. I am a widow, 28 years old, with two children, a boy and a girl. I am about to embark on a strange adventure, which I will set down upon these pages as it unfolds. It begins with a letter which I received today from the King of Siam. Madam, we are in good pleasure and satisfaction in heart that you are in willingness to undertake the education of our beloved royal children. We beg to invite you to our royal palace to do your best endeavorment upon us and our children. We shall expect to see you here on return of Siamese steamer Chao Paya. The letter arrived on February 26th. I arranged for my daughter to stay with friends in Shanghai. And a short time later, my son and I and our two servants were on the Chao Paya, bound for Siam. The ship moved up a river and into the Arabian Nights. We saw houses thatched with palms and the spires and turrets of castles. And by the time it was dark, we were at anchor. My small household waited uncertainly on deck with me. And finally, out of the shadows flashed a long gondola beautifully carved like a dragon with torches reflected upon the rhythmic dip of white paddles. A Siamese official mounted the side of the chow pyre and came up to me. Good evening, sir. Uh, are you speaking to me? But of course. Good evening, sir. Are you the lady who is to teach the royal family? I am. Where is your husband? My husband is dead. Then where will you go in the evening? No. Really, that is none of your affair. As you please. Have you friends in Bangkok? I know no one in Bangkok at all. What will you do? Where will you sleep tonight? I don't know. 
I am a stranger here, but I understood from His Majesty's letter that a residence would be provided for me on my arrival. His Majesty cannot remember everything. You can go wherever you like. Good night. He's gone. But this is impossible. This is lame Owen. This is no place for a woman like you. Let me take you back on the south wire. Captain Owen, I can't possibly go back. I've given my word. You come from another boat, Mama. Who's below? Captain Goldberg, the harbormaster. Captain Bush, come aboard, sir. That's just what I'm doing, Captain Orton. Uh, Mrs. Leon Owens, may I present Captain Bush, the harbormaster? How do you do, Captain Bush? I'm very happy to meet you, ma'am. My wife and I would be most pleased if you would accept our hospitality for the night. Oh, thank you. I didn't know what to do. Well, there's nothing to do. This is Siam. The important point here is to be able to wait until things come to you. In due time, the Crowler Home will arrange an appointment for you with the King. The who will arrange an appointment for me? The Crowler Home, the man who just left. He's the Prime Minister, the most important man in the Kingdom. In the meantime, you come with me. <laughs> Sleep? Yes, finally. My wife is upstairs. She'll be down shortly. I'm lonely tonight. I miss my little girl so dreadfully. She's in Shanghai. And tell me, Mrs. Leonowitz, whatever made a woman like you decide to come to Siam? I needed the job. You were teaching school in Singapore. You can't convince me it wasn't something more than needing a job. Well, perhaps it was a little something more than just a job. After all, here is a rare, rare opportunity for a teacher. Here is a chance to teach the children of a king what they might do for their people. Here, perhaps, might even be a chance to teach a king. I'm afraid you won't teach this king much of anything. And incidentally, you're going to see him tomorrow afternoon. A message came from the Crowler home a few minutes ago. Tomorrow afternoon? <laughs> Your Majesty, the new English governess, Mrs. Anna Harriet Leon Owens, and her son, Louis. Uh -huh. How old shall you be? Why, well, I, I, I don't see that Why I... Why do you make all those sputterings? Kindly to come to the answer. Well, sire, I... I am 150 years old, sire. <laughs> in what year were you born? I was born in 1712, Your Majesty. How many years shall you be married? For several years, Your Majesty. Oh, then how many grandchildren shall you have by now? How many? How many? How many? Well, I... <laughs> well, I... you have lost the battle, sir. I have wind you. Come. Give me your hand. I'll show you something. Oh, oh you're going so fast. I, I can't keep up. I... Oh, please, if you'd only go slower. Now, I open these doors. How many children have you? <laughs> Two. I have six. Sixty-seven. There they are, down in the courtyard. Sixty-seven? All yours? All mine. You shall educate them for me. And as many of my wives also as may wish to learn English. And I have much correspondence in which you must assist me. You may go. Well, then, do I... Uh, oh, one more thing. It is our pleasure that you shall reside within this palace among our family. Your Majesty, that is impossible. What? I shall be happy to work here during the school day. But I must have a home of my own outside the palace where I can go when my duties are over. I... I couldn't stand it here when those gates shut and lock in the evening. Where do you go in the evening? Not anywhere, Your Majesty. I am a stranger here. Then why shall you object to the gates being shut? I don't really know. But I do know I couldn't stand it. I beg Your Majesty to remember that in your gracious letter, you promised me a residence adjoining the palace, not within it. I do not know what I have promised, and I do not know former condition. I do not know anything but you are my servant. And it is my pleasure that you live in the palace, and you shall obey. Your Majesty has perhaps forgotten that I am not a servant, but a governess. I am prepared to obey all Your Majesty's commands within the obligation of my duty to your family. But beyond that, I can promise no obedience. You shall live in the palace! You shall live in the palace! I will not. You will live in the palace! We will discuss this again when you are not so excited. <laughs> you shall commence royal school in our pavilion Thursday next. That is the best day for such undertaking in the estimation of our astrologers. You may go, sir. Yes, Your Majesty. 
Thank you, Your Majesty. Good day, Your Majesty. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Anna and the King of Siam, starring Deborah Carr. Scholar and statesman, poet and protege of the king, this was Joseph Addison. And way back in the 18th century, it was Addison, one of the greatest of English essayists, who said, words, when well chosen, have so great a force. Today, too, as Addison found true so long ago, a word well chosen can be a great force in cementing friendships, assuaging griefs, strengthening love. And no one appreciates the power of well chosen words more than the makers of Hallmark cards. That is why the words in a Hallmark card accurately reflect your own feeling, whatever the occasion. Heartfelt congratulations, warm birthday or anniversary wishes, or just a thoughtful hello to distant friends. There's a Hallmark card that says just what you want to say, the way you want to say it. And what is true of the right words in a Hallmark card is equally true of everything else about it. It's artful design, quality materials, superb craftsmanship. So when you choose a card to express just you to a friend, to a loved one, remember to look for the hallmark on the back. That tells them you cared enough to send the very best. And now here is the second act of Anna and the King of Siam, starring Deborah Carr. and I was given a house a short distance from the palace where I set up housekeeping with Louis and my two servants. On Thursday, the king sent for me and Louis and I were conducted to the temple. A long, finely carved table with chairs about it stood in the center of the temple facing a golden Buddha. The king clapped his hands and female slaves appeared, crawling expertly across the floor, carrying boxes of slates, pencils, ink, pens, and Webster's Speller, which they shoved up onto the table. The king introduced each child to me, and then he spoke to them and translated what he had said. Dear children, it is our pleasure that you shall be educated in English as well as in your own language. To study hard and make the best of your opportunities, I command you. This is a privilege no royal children have ever had before. You are to make the best use of it. All right, children, open your books to page one. They don't understand you, Mama. Open your book, Louis, and show them. Open book. That's right. Open the books. Now look. This letter, A. This letter, A. A. Very good. Now try again. A. And now time began to hurry by, and the days gathered themselves into weeks and then months. Around me, the busy life of the slaves, the harem, the city, and the court went on, but my mind and heart was busy with my students. This is the world. As you see, it is round. Now, I will turn the globe around and show you your country. Here we are. This is Siam. Oh. But it is so little. Yes, but look, here is the country I come from, England. You see, it is even smaller. It is such a pretty yellow color. It is a very pretty country. I wish I could show it to you. I wish I could take you to London and let you lift your faces against the coolness of the fog. I wish we could stand together, you and I, and watch the guards in their scarlet uniforms changing in front of Buckingham Palace. Old guard, present arms. New guard, present arms. I wish we could sit beside the waters of the Thames and I tell you of the kings and queens who sat there before us. Oh, I 
wish we could see it all today. Piccadilly and Trafalgar and Leicester Square. And people's faces, the wonderful, confident, independent reflection of freedom on the face of England. I, I do not think we all understand. I know you don't. But I am going to do my best to make you understand. I want you to know that a king does not have to rule by fear and that a good king does not enslave his people, but sets them free. Freedom. There was little freedom in Siam. One afternoon, I was on my way to a ceremonial and I lost my way. I happened into a courtyard where a woman lay chained to the ground, a small boy of about four near her. I spoke to her. I'd been in Siam long enough now to understand what she answered when I asked her. Why are you chained here? I am Mohammedan. I am a slave. But all the Mohammedans here are under British protection and they can't be enslaved. My parents sold themselves to my mistress, grandfather. That was their debt, which they paid. But why are you chained here? Because I tried to purchase my freedom. I was given my purchase money by a Mohammedan noble woman. I offered it to my mistress, and she refused to accept it. So I managed to escape, and I married a merchant. And then, a few months after my marriage, as I was sitting on the steps of my home, I was seized and brought here. I was left here until it came time for my child to be born. And here, I was chained again. One month after his birth. Who is your mistress? Chao Chum Nanda Ong. She is one of the most powerful women in the country. The king is her son-in-law. I will see what I can do. So, now you are interfering between mistresses and slaves. What is just is just, Your Majesty. Is justice to be administered by your standards or ours? You do not believe in slavery. We do. The law of your country states that bond servants have the right to redeem themselves. So you have been invading our laws. I have been studying them. Farewell. Your petition is granted. You speak the truth. It is the law. Your Majesty. The chief of the female judges, her ladyship, Kung Teo Up, will make an investigation of the case of the slave girl. You will see, sir, that even though Siam is not England, there is justice in Siam. <laughs> The slave law is declared by this court to be free. Release her chains. Siam memories. Colorful, glittering memories set to oriental music. Memories threaded with dark strands of loneliness for the daughter growing up in Shanghai. Memories of people hungry for food hungry for knowledge. Memories of a king like no other king that had ever existed before. I sent for you. Why were you so long in coming? Well, I, I, I was in bed, Your Majesty. It took a certain amount of time to get dressed. 18th of October, 1863. 18th of October, 1863. Ma'am, do you understand the meaning of the word agility? Your Majesty is certainly giving me a very practical illustration of the word. On the 18th of October, 1863, I shall be 59 years old. And you can see that I am as young and as strong as ever. But here, in this very newspaper that I hold in my hand, American missionaries have said that I am a spare man. How can I be a spare man? A king cannot be a spare man. How can I be spared from my kingdom? Who can fill my place, I ask you? Who can fill my place? Your Majesty, the word spare has two meanings. One meaning is thin. All the missionaries meant to say is that you are a thin man. I am not unnecessary as they have suggested. They must know that I am not a spare man. They must know that I am as young as ever. You will notify them immediately. Yes, Your Majesty. Yes. Uh, before you go, there is something I would like to give you. I am well pleased with you. 
A diamond ring. Your Majesty. You are a very attractive woman. Your Majesty, if I accept this ring, what does it mean in your country? The same as it means in yours. Your Majesty, I... I thank you for the honor you are paying me, but I cannot possibly accept. No woman has ever refused me before. If she did, she would not live long. I am sorry, but you must understand that I come from a different land where there are different customs. Our customs are better. That is a matter of opinion, Your Majesty. It is a matter of record. You will not change me. No matter what you say to me, you will not change me. You'd like to change me, but you won't. Go back to your schoolroom and stay there. I went back to my schoolroom, and there the king left me in peace for a month or two. And then he forgot his anger, and he sent for me again to write some letters for him. I remained in Siam five years. I saw comedy. I saw tragedy. I saw death. I saw birth. When at last I knew that I must return and make a home for my daughter, I had come to love many of the Siamese people, and not least among them was the young prince. On the day I decided to leave, we sat talking for a long time while I wondered how to tell him. Mimcha, I have been thinking. It is a sad thing for the United States that Abraham Lincoln is dead, is it not? Very sad. I have been reading his Emancipation Proclamation over and over, as you asked that I should, and I have come to a decision. Yes? Mimcha, if I live to reign over Siam, I shall reign over a free and not an enslaved nation. I will free my people. Oh, if you do. If you do, then you will be a great king. So, you will free the country. Yes, Father. This is your doing. This is the payment I get for bringing you here to teach. You, you serpent that I brought into the nest. You're making Englishmen of my people. No, only human beings. You lie, you lie, you lie. You've betrayed me. You've ruined Siam. No, Father, no. She has brought a new life to Siam. Now my son is talking back to me. Is there no end to the damages you have wrought? Well, I shall do no more damages, Your Majesty. I am leaving Siam. You are what? I am going home. You can't go home. You are ungrateful. I am tired. You are lazy. You're not to go. I need of you. You are to stay. Do you hear me? I said you are to stay. Your Majesty, I have a daughter who needs me. I haven't seen her for five years. I have a son who must grow to manhood in his own country. I have given all the years I can, Your Majesty. I must leave now. No, no, no! And so Louis and I left Siam, and the voices of those I had loved floated after us from the palace as we stood by the ship taking our last look. Those are the voices of your students, Memcha, calling to you from the palace. I shall carry their voices with me always. Will you tell them that for me, Prince Tudalankorn? I will tell them. Uh, Memcha, in this envelope you will find a photograph of myself which I trust will meet your approbation and which I hope you will keep in memory of the affections of your pupil. I will keep it. Mem Memcha, I will remember you always. Goodbye, my prince. So, you defy me to the last. You really intend to leave? I must. You are a very difficult woman. Last night, one of my wives, the Lady Sonkin, freed all of her slaves. She said it was because of you and Abraham Lincoln. Well, Your Majesty, I can't truthfully say that I'm sorry, and I'm sure that Abraham Lincoln isn't either. You have both caused much commotion in the world. You leave Siam in the twilight of my world. I am half of the old world, half of the new. My son here is all of the new. My world is at its twilight. We are indeed sorry to see you go. We hope you will return in not too long a time. Thank you, Your Majesty. You have brought many changes. We have not always seen eye to eye. 
but you have earned our respect and our everlasting esteem. Thank you. Goodbye, Your Majesty. Goodbye, my friend. I have left Siam, and the prow of the Chow Paya is turned towards England. The adventure is over. But I carry the knowledge in my heart that the prince will remember me. And in that lies my hope for dawn in Siam, the dawn of freedom. It grows dark, Mama. You can no longer see Siam. You are wrong, my son. You are wrong. It grows light over Siam. It grows light James Hilton and Deborah Carr will return in a moment. Calling all collectors, those young collectors of the famous Hallmark Dolls of the Nations. For now, there are eight brand new dolls, making a total of 36 dolls that so many youngsters love. You know, these gay Hallmark Dolls educate while they fascinate, because each represents a different country, and each carries a clever verse telling of that country's enchanting sights and customs. The eight new dolls are charming little ambassadors from Ireland, Sweden, Alaska, Switzerland from Scotland, Australia, Hawaii, and mysterious India. Like their cousins from other lands, they stand by themselves, wear colorful costumes, and hats topped off with a real feather plume. Delight del del some child you know with these captivating dolls, as easy to send as any Hallmark card. At only 25 cents each, you couldn't choose a more welcome, constructive gift. And for only one dollar, you can buy two dolls and a Hallmark collector's album, roomy enough to hold the entire collection. See them tomorrow at the store where you buy your Hallmark greeting cards. Here again is James Hilton. Thank you very much, Deborah Carr, for your delightful performance and a lovely story. We all hope that it won't be long before we have you again on the Hallmark Playhouse. That's very nice of you, Mr. Hilton, and thanks to Ted Osborne for his fine performance as the king. You know, this is my first visit to the Hallmark Playhouse, and incidentally, one of my few appearances on American radio... It has been one thing I've looked forward to and enjoyed very much. Well, after this, you certainly aren't a stranger, and you can count on a great welcome here on the Hallmark Playhouse. As a matter of fact, Mr. Hilton, I've never felt like a stranger as far as Hallmark is concerned. Your cards are a constant reminder of the goodwill and thoughtfulness that exists between us all. And I think your Hallmark dolls are lovely. I especially enjoyed Sandy of Scotland, since I know that country so well. <laughs> I can imagine how much children love them. Thank you again, Miss Deborah Carr, for all of that and also for your fine performance. Oh, and I understand that next week we will have the pleasure of hearing your own novel, so well remembered. It's a wonderful story, and I urge all of our audience to be sure to be listening. Well, yes, we are doing so well remembered next week, and we are honored in having Van Heflin as the star. And the following week, we will present W.F. Harvey's August Heat, starring Fred McMurray. Our director-producer is Bill Gay, our music is composed and conducted by Lynn Murray, and our script tonight was adapted by Jean Holloway. Until next Thursday, then, this is James Hilton saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember Hallmark cards when you carry enough to send the very best. Deborah Carr appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Technicolor musical That Midnight Kiss, starring Catherine Grayson, Jose Turby, Ethel Barrymore, and Mario Lanza. This is Frank Goss saying good night to you all and inviting you next Thursday and every Thursday to tune in one half hour earlier and listen to the adventures of Casey, crime photographer, followed by the Hallmark Playhouse. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is KNBC, Kansas City, Missouri.